G'day Andy Socialites, this is Ryan Quarrington here. You might remember me from episode 227 and from South Australian band Shatterbrain and Alkira. I'm momentarily commandeering this episode to plug Shatterbrain's debut album, Pitchfork Justice, which is out now via Wormhole Death Records. It's available for streaming wherever you stream your music, or if you're a fan of old school physical, you can pick up a CD or a vinyl along with any other band paraphernalia you can think of via our online store at shatterbrainmetal.com. Thanks for listening, over to you Andy and Larry. Hey, before we kick into this week's episode, come and join me on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Andy Daly is the number one best way to support this podcast. Support starts from only a buck a month. Dirt cheap, set and forget. You won't even notice it. And if you want access to free shit, basically, if you want access to free stuff, then uh, there are additional tiers to get access to free merch, giveaways. Also, the exclusive Patreon podcast that comes out every Tuesday morning at uh, I was going to say 8 a.m., but no, it's actually 6 a.m. Come on, Andy, wake up earlier. And uh, the Patreon episode in particular um, has a bit of everything. It's got a bit of karaoke from your mate Andy. It's got some old 90s television commercials, uh, just you know, putting the, just breaking it up a bit, giving everyone a bit of a toilet break. And uh, we, we, we have a story for the week. We've got um, planes, trains, and animobiles. We've got um, whatever music I've been listening to for the past week. So we go through Release Radar. I talk about a lot of my mates playing in uh, you know, Australian bands and, and international bands. Um, I talk about what I've been watching, just crazy shit on YouTube or documentaries or shit on Netflix, stuff that I've been reading, just whatever, whatever's going on in my life and any little hints and secrets and things that are coming up. I'd love to give my Patreon community a little bit of a heads up on stuff as well. So go and check it all out over at patreon.com slash Andy Down. Hey, it's episode 284 of the Andy Social Podcast, and my guest on this episode is Dave Lupton. Dave is the front man for Sydney metal band Flaming Wreckage, and they have a brand new album out right now called Cathedral of Bones. And uh, I tell you what, sounds good, looks good, and is appearing to do really well for them. I mean, it's it's they're showing up everywhere. And I mentioned this a couple of times in this chat. I've known of the band for the past 10 years, um, certainly, you know, them being Sydney guys as well, yeah, getting around the traps, playing shows, putting music out over the years. But in the last several months, I've not seen them show up like they have in my line of vision. Um, in the in this in these past several months, as they have over the past you know ten years, um, and I think that's just a testament to to the amount of hard work the guys have put in themselves, and also having like this amazing support network of just fucking pros helping them out. And we talk a bit about that in this chat as well. Dave's an absolute legend. I'm gonna have links to him. I'm gonna have links to the band. Uh, just everything will be in the show notes over at andysocial.net and andydowling.net. Go to flamingwreckage.com. Go and check out the videos for The Voiceless and Running Blind. And there's also a, um, a video series that's just come out, uh, I think last week at the time of this episode coming out, uh, from House Fox Studios. There's a live session and also a really, really cool interview um, with, with the guys. So I'm going to link to that as well. So enough crapping on for me. Please enjoy this great chat with the man himself, Dave Lupton. Yeah, obviously the album's out now, and yep. I think you're you're pretty much in the guts of of getting around the country and playing shows and all that sort of stuff. What's um, what's that experience been like for you so far with with regards to sort of having to hustle and get word out there about this this album and this release? Has that been a bit of a grind? Um, in, well, we've had really good PR on this record, which has been immensely helpful. Um, we had. Uh, Dicey's new thing, uh, Cult Etiquette. Mm. So he's just gotten us a shitload of interviews and reviews and stuff. So in terms of that, it's been quite easy. Um, in terms of booking the tour, <laughs> that was a different story. Um, we had like last year was obviously a, a total shit fight and we, we had stuff planned and that got cancelled and re just like rebooked like again and again. And it was just one of those things we had to kind of just stay ahead of the, ahead of the game a little bit like if something got canned, we just tried to rebook it almost straight away. Um, just just because we didn't want to end up in that position where we're like, you know, a few months behind because we just wanted to wait, wait it out and then basically the whole year's gone. So, yeah, it was a really frustrating booking process, but I'm very grateful that we've managed to piece together anything, really. So, um, and we've got heaps of shows in the pipeline for the whole year, so that's been cool. Um, we've, we've done like two 
uh, so far. And um, they were both cool, man. They were like seated, but um, still a show. And it was fucking loose. Like it's probably about as loose as you can get for a seated crowd. I reckon that's the new thing. So um, yeah, it was really fun. Um, and like, yeah, like the whole seated thing was, you know, it was a bit weird, but like. Um, it's yeah, it's still a show, and like I think, like one thing that's really come of this whole situation is people's um, appreciation for live music. Like, you know, it, it just it just feels like everyone took it for granted last year. There was always so many shows, and now that um, now everything's selling out. You know, people are buying tickets and stuff straight away, which is really good to see. Um, you know, because they you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, sort of thing. So just to see that appreciation out there, it's been. It's been great. It's been really inspiring. Yeah, I've been I've been crapping on about it for for quite a while about what will come out of this past twelve months, and I I really reckon, and you're starting to see glimpses of it as as you just said, like where I think it's going to be a bit of a resurgence of local oh, man, music I, I, and music yeah. in Australia. Yeah, I just think I think people are going to be hungry for it, and as you said before, I, I think we just took it for granted, and so you could just sit back on a friday or saturday or whenever and just go ah can't be fucked you know whatever i might see them next time they roll around maybe yeah for sure man and just like yeah just getting back to what i was saying before like i couldn't believe how quickly um those two shows sold out like it was crazy and then you know you, you, you can't really do door spots in the moment so a few of the supports and like close mates that are just you know hoping that they'd just be able to rock up on the day i was like nothing i can really do man like, I know this is not, not something that is, like, regular for, for us, like, selling out stuff. Um, but, yeah, it's been, it's been really cool. But it's also, like, just, like, in that Newcastle show we did the other week, like, one of the support bands was just, like, on the day, just sort of going, oh, yeah, but, you know, I had all these people that were going to come. And I'm like, man, it's just nothing I can do. It's, like, it's, it's the venue. It's not even the venue. It's the government. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's, a bit, it's a bit over everyone's head. So, um but yeah, man, this response has been cool so far, so oh, it's going well. Yeah, I, I mean, as, as frustrating as that would be for, for those sort of inner circle mates who, you know, historically might be able to sort of rock up on the night and yeah. and take a bit more of a casual approach, I mean, it's it's kind of nice in a way to send a bit of a message to people to say, look, you, you, can't, you can't afford to snooze anymore. And, yeah, that's uh, right. And definitely, definitely get out early where you can and, and, you know, grab a ticket and support support your mates and all that sort of stuff. And even if it's just a, you know, a short space of time where, you know, as you said before, like, you know, you can't do door spots and things like that. And you're really restricted about, you know, the amount of people that you can, you can actually invite and, and offer tickets to that, um, that it will yeah, encourage would, people to like, do the right thing. That's right. I mean, I'd feel, I'd feel pretty bad if I asked someone for a door spot right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, you, you, you're keeping a venue in like, and like venues and bands going by by paying, and and the other thing is you can um, just just to make these shows work, you've got to charge a bit more. Mm. And I like for the Sydney show, um, I was kind of worried about that. I was like, oh, it's a bit much. Like I don't know how that's going to go. And then yeah, we just ripped through the like both allocations really quickly. So you know, yeah, man, people are people are not going to snooze on it. Like I said, they're, they're hungry. So yeah, I think it's going to be like this for a while. Like people are just going to buy tickets straight away. Um, which is great. Like, it's just good to see. Sort of just putting value back on live music again. Just understanding that you know, you know, the the days of going to a show and and having a whinge because you've got to pay five bucks to get in the, into the venue now, are, yeah. you know, hopefully are long gone with most people because they'll just go. You know what? Like, as I said before, like we we've taken taken it for granted to an extent, and now we can see the the reason why we pay a premium to go and see you know entertainment, see bands, see people get up on stage and perform and and hopefully yeah, hopefully right. some of these things will stick long term as far as that demand yeah I, I i always found that to be really weird like people that would just bitch about door prices and stuff it's like oh 20 bucks come on <laughs> but what else are you going to do you'll just go out anyway and spend 200 bucks behind the bar oh so, easy, you know, easy yeah you could just go see a band like yeah for sure i remember the the shows that we've done over the years where you play sort of like a regional place or you might just do a cheapy show just to, just to try something different. The the cheap yeah. ones were always the ones that you got the worst response from people as far as complaining about having to pay for anything. But as soon yeah, as you yeah. started doing those shows where they were sort of into, you know, sort of that $20 mark that the people complaining were just, 
they just disappeared. Like it was almost like those people were just instantly just removed from the equation and they just didn't even bother to, to show up. But it's just, it was almost like the we were, we were allowing people to complain. Whereas when we started to jack the price up, it was sort of a case of, there was just no point of those people complaining anymore. And, and we never saw a difference in the numbers at all, like whatsoever. It was just the noise sort of just quietened down. So I think there's an yeah. interesting sort of perception with, sort of how you put yourself out there and that whole marketing and putting a dollar value against, uh, against, you know, yourself as a, as a performer in a band. Yeah, that's right. Um, and just uh, what you were saying there, like with the, with the regional stuff, like it's just, it's, it's always funny when you rock up to those venues and, you know, often they're just pissed off because you, you, know, you rocked up to their local at the wrong time. <laughs> you just make a load of noise when they're trying to, when they're trying to drink. <laughs> so like, um, I love those shows, man. Like I love doing regional stuff. Like we kind of we've kind of decided this year that we're going to try and do like more regionals than ever, just because like you're not going to. I don't want to do the East Coast for the rest of my life, and like we're not going to be able to go overseas for a little while still. I think so. We might as well just hit some uncharted territory here, um, and just play some of those towns because like. You know, just getting back to what we were saying before about you know people seeing the, the value in live music. There's always someone that's whinging that you didn't go to their their little town, but when you do go there, and now more than ever, they're gonna really appreciate that and and come out. So, you know, like some some of those little shows, man, like Lismore or like Maryborough or wherever the fuck, like um, we, they're like all our like best tour stories. <laughs> there's always some loose shit that goes on in those places. <laughs> People buy heaps of merch there as well. I reckon they're really fun. They're definitely worth doing, like just on the side of the major cities. Oh yeah, man. I I, I think um, now sort of getting well, we haven't quite got post COVID, but sort of getting to the tail end of this whole saga. Um, and as you said before, like not being able to tour overseas, like you know, no one's going to be able to. Co- well, no one's going to be going to be able to confidently go and tour overseas, even even if you can get out of the country. And I just think that there is just so much of this country that is just being neglected or has been neglected for a long time. So I think you're on the money, yeah. mate. I think um, a, a regional touring circuit and an active, like an active sort of consistent touring circuit with a lot of bands going through these towns, I think it'll just reawaken live music, not just in the, in the major cities, but all over the country. And the biggest bands yeah. in this country are the ones who slogged it out in these regional centers for years. And that's where a lot of the, that fan base comes from. So it's uh, it's a good, a good thing to be eyeing off. Yeah, for sure. I'm like, I don't know, man, you don't want to be too picky all the time about, you know, playing the best venue and the best show. Like a lot of those places are like, you often just playing in like just the pub and it's just a vocal PA and it's a bit of a shit setup, but like it can be really fun. And like, if, yeah, like you were just saying there, like if more, if more bands are doing it, it might, you know, sort of re- re-energize those towns and there might be a bit of cash sort of injected into, into them to maybe get some more like, um, more tour friendly venues like that are that are cranking out bands look like every weekend. So yeah, I reckon that's a hope hopefully we can get that happening. I know like there's a I know the Hidden Intent boys are pretty they got their hearts set on doing pretty much the same thing. And I think like both of our bands have that in common. Like we always try and do like regional stuff. And like for us it just came out of necessity because we just like I, I don't really want to drive to Brisbane just to do one show. Yeah. And then drive home. So we'd always just try and stop in somewhere on the way, even if it was a, a bit of a dog shit setup. Like you're still gonna sell a bit of merch and have a good time. Like I think um, just prioritising those, yeah, those, those big cities is kind of a, a bit of a dead formula. You got to think outside the box. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think um, when you said before about sort of some of the best tour, tour stories are, are sort of playing these, you know, rural and regional areas. And I mean, even just from a, not so much, cause I mean, it's a different dynamic, you know, you can't sort of, you can't sort of try and get any sort of guarantee or deal. It's very hard to sort of get that sort of oh, confidence yeah, yeah. from the locals, but you know, just from a merch point of view, a lot of these guys, even if it's a small metal community or rock community that comes out, they're so pumped that there's a band coming through town and they see you play and you know, the amount of times that we've sort of rocked up to the merch table after our set and the guys are just like, can we just get one of everything? Because they're sort of yeah, in, yeah. in their mindset of, we don't know if you guys are ever going to come back. So we're just going to take advantage of this and just uh, just clean you out. And it's absolutely fantastic. And, and even to this day, like, 
you know, some places that we've played and we've only been able to play once, but those people are still diehard fans of ours, even though they haven't seen us play in like 10 years. And you just yeah. sort of think, man, like there's so many more of those stories and situations all across this country. Even if you just stuck to New South Wales alone, that would keep you busy for ages. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, for years, it's just been a case of, ah, oh, it's just not worth it. It's not financially viable or, you know, for the time and effort. But um, I, I just think people haven't bothered to put the effort in. And I think it might be to what you said before around a lot of these places do have pretty subpar setups and, and it's not the greatest of circumstances from a from a you know equipment and gear perspective and being able to perform and put on the show that you want to put on. And I think if you can get past that in your head and just go, just being here is half the battle, then I think that's where you're going to get all that, all that value. Yeah, that's right, man. And it's like... Um... The crowd buying all your merch is their way of saying that they really appreciate that you've made that effort to go however far it is. Like, I remember the last time we played in, we played that Blacken Festival, mm. um, which is so sick. I don't know if you've ever been, but no. it's so good. Oh, man, it's the best. It's like, they used to be in Alice Springs, but they moved it slightly further out, and now it's just, like, in the middle of the desert. <laughs> it's just, like, nothing for, like, three hours either side of it or something. But um, we played at like one in the morning, like we closed out the night on the first night. And um, by the time we got off stage, all our merch was already packed up and I was kind of like, oh, fuck, that sucks. And then the next morning, um, we were staying, we were staying on and just watching the rest of the festival. And I was like, oh, maybe we'll just chuck it back up and see what happens. And then we just pumped through like pretty much everything we brought. Yay. Like all these people, like. I didn't even see last night. I just remembered us, you know, a pissed as at 1 a.m. Like, oh, yeah, you guys are pretty good. I'll, like, yeah, one of everything. Yeah, it was awesome. That's cool. Yeah. I, I love I love stories like that. And I think it's just that it's just it just boils down to making the effort to go and travel somewhere where people don't normally get that opportunity. And I think I think it's that sort of acknowledgement from their side to say, you know, we, we see you guys. We see you guys are making the effort and not everybody bothers to make that effort. So, you know, we're going to we're gonna show our appreciation, whether it be just getting up the front and getting into the music or or even better still, um, just, you know, buying a T-shirt or a CD or, or getting a lot, you know. So it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. And, I mean, especially, you know, you'll be the same as us. You know, you play Sydney 50 million times over the years and, you know, eventually your regulars – start to pick and choose the times that they come and see you and and then yeah. uh, some some nights are great some nights are not so great and you sort of you know you, you, you see some of your mates out and about and you go hey you weren't at that show on saturday night it's like oh yeah you know and then they come up with some bs and it's like oh, all right okay and so just the the appreciation in that um that demand is just not there in in the larger cities because i guess you you know we have been sport for choice and sort of yeah. circles back to what we said at the start yeah for sure man um yeah, like, I mean, it is expensive to hit those towns sometimes. Like, you know, if you, like, we, we're doing Perth on this tour and that, like, I'm sure you know, is yeah. a absolute wallet drainer. But, you know, you got, like, you got to go there, man. Like, it's, if, it's a, if it's a big tour like this one, like an album launch tour, you just got to suck it up and just lose a bit of cash and just hit those places because, you know, it's it's just part of, it's just, it's, a, it's the next step into, you know, expanding that market. And it's just like anywhere, man, like, you got to you, you got to keep going back to places to to build that fan base. So um, I think it's really important to just think outside the East Coast because there's way more out there. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think you, you can no doubt you guys have already sort of taken this approach. But with a lot of bands, you can you can take a really smart sort of perspective on on putting a tour together and then those shows where yeah you you know you're going to be you know robbing the bank you know you're not gonna you're not gonna be getting anything out of this you're gonna be losing money but it's offset yeah. by your confident shows in in either your hometown or some of these more local areas where your overheads aren't as high and you don't have all those travel costs involved and so when you balance out the whole tour hopefully you're more than likely you know you, you, you neutral across the board you sort of cancelled out your costs or you know best case scenario you, you're starting to make profit but um yeah it's it's tough if you're just doing like those shows just just as one-offs and nothing else is happening. Um, yeah, and I see bands do that and I go, I don't know how you guys survive. It's just, it's just crazy. Like, it's like, oh, every six months we're just going to do a random show somewhere in the country and they pick yeah. Perth and you just think, oh man, like some, somebody's, somebody's lending the band some money <laughs> and they're going to, they're going to have to pay yeah, that yeah. one back. 
yeah, you've got to take out a loan to go there. Yeah, yeah. like I think, um, I mean, what's been great for us um, in the last, just since this album's come out, it's only been a couple of months, but like we've been, we've, we've managed to pay off a lot of debt and like we just, we're that one step closer to becoming a band that's like, we, we don't have to ask around and like chuck in for tours anymore, which is one thing I really want to make like, like a, a huge point of because, you know, the longer you do it, you, you feel a bit Because I pretty much do like, you know, the, the majority of the management side of things. So if it, if there ever is something that's a bit on the expensive side and we have to chuck in for it, I feel so bad. Like asking the dudes just to throw in a few hundred bucks for something. But, you know, um, just having that goal in mind of like, you know, just being a bit more wise with where you spend your money and do it, like and, and the routing of the tour can like really help with that as mm. well like no, knowing where you yeah your big markets are you probably want to start there so that can find the rest of the tour and stuff like and you know you, you learn from not like fucking that up from pre- on previous tours of course but um i always look to like like psychoptic are a massive inspiration for me personally just because like those guys have made it work and they have to fly everywhere like they can do like one or two shows in Tassie, and they don't even play there that often anymore. But like, even the tour of Australia, it's just all flights. So like, you know, when you're in a situation where you have to make it work, um, you know, like we've played with those dudes a few times, and it's pretty, um, it's yeah, it's it's crazy. Like they just so switched on. Dave's like on his laptop doing spreadsheet stuff before they go on stage. Like <laughs> it's just a full on like well oiled machine, very well managed. Like. And yeah, it's it's great to see. Yeah, that and like it's all it's also a reminder of like you know, um, the older you get, like this, you still got to keep working really, really fucking hard to, to to keep it at that level where you know the, the band is like comfortably paying for everything. Yeah, definitely. I think I think Socroptic has has definitely sort of forged the path for a lot of bands in the past. You know, at least ten years. Um, just their work ethic, and I think just taking a very smart approach and you know i mean yeah. we i think we've we've i mean we've definitely crossed paths with them over the years and and played the odd weird weird sort of mixed bill show with them and um and yeah dave dave's just a really really intelligent guy and i mean he's just had so much success you know even outside of psychroptic in his own you know his own profile as a as a musician and also just a, a businessman like he's just uh incredibly switched on i think that's 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 almost their secret weapon. And obviously, you know, he is one of the one of the greatest extreme metal drummers out there. But um, but I think from a business point of view, I think that's where their their real success comes from. And it is it is yeah. very interesting and inspiring to sort of watch them carve out a, a road for a lot of other bands to start looking at them as a bit of a blueprint. So yeah, it's it's no surprise yeah, that uh, yeah you, you said that. Yeah, the way they go about it's just. Yeah, it's, it's it's really good, but um, and but also like to do that, you need the support of everyone else in your band to make that happen. And um, one thing for me personally that I've really been trying to work on in the last year is just like being a bit more patient with like delegation because I'm really impatient when it comes to <laughs> well, like I, I have this never ending to do list, and I'm like I always just go, all right, Locke, you can take care of this. And then I'm like, fuck, he hasn't replied in an hour. I could have just done it by now. (laughs) And and then this is something else for me to do. But like, I've really tried to focus on not doing that. Like, you know, it's like, no, it's all right. I trust him. He'll do it. It's all good. Um, So that is, you know, it's a bit less stressful if you operate it like that. And um, like a a big one for me was just like having pretty much nothing to do with merch anymore. Because I just like didn't have time to go to the post office and like just, it was just too much like stock and shit in my flat. So I was just like, if someone else could do this, this would save me so much fucking time. But now that I don't have to do that, that's a, that's a, that's a big, big time saver. But um, yeah, just little things like that, man. It's made it's made it a lot easier to to manage for sure. And it must help with the other guys in the band where you know they're getting getting things to do outside of them just being the musician and performing and writing and recording all that sort of stuff where they. They they're feeling more empowered to sort of contribute and and lend a hand, and so it probably helps. You know, I mean, I don't know what the band dynamic has been over the years, but no doubt it keep brings you guys closer, and everyone's more sort of uh, mentally invested into it, not just financially, because they can actually yeah. see all the all the moving pieces, and they're helping to sort of make it happen. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I think you know, you would know better than anyone, but like 
you know, rocking up and playing is a very small percentage of what you need to do mm. as a band. And, and it is a unit. So, yeah, just that appreciation from everyone is really valuable to us. Like knowing that it's like one person can't do this on their own. It's, it's a, it is a team. And, um, just the more things that we can do to help each other out, it just makes everything easier. Um, like Juzzy as well. He's like, he's gotten really good at like video editing and stuff, which is also something that I just, I'm not interested in at all. Like, <laughs> um, so yeah, just this little things like that, man. It just it makes it makes the whole thing flow a lot easier. Was there? I mean, you mentioned before about sort of one of the one of those goals is to get to a point where you're not having to put the pressure on yourself and everyone else in the band to be, you know, putting their hand in their own pocket to sort of fund what the next things are. You know, from a band perspective, um, has that has that caused tension in the past, you know, as far as people sort of feeling obliged or having a bit of pressure to sort of financially contribute to, to a tour or to a recording or anything like that? Cause I mean, I, luckily for us, I mean, it's been, it's been quite a while since we've, we've had to do that. And I, I mean, it's just such a, but we're definitely the exception. I mean, we, you know, for most bands, it's a, uh, it's a really tough thing and a reality where it's not just you dedicating your time. It's, it's, dedicating money is cash and that can usually yeah, cause right. a lot of tension yeah no we have had that in the past just um especially with like previous members just like never having any fucking money and it's just i like i've always um i've gotten better at this as well but i always used to just pull the trigger on something and then just worry about it later and like whether it be like we can't afford this now but this is a great opportunity let's just fucking do it and then we'll figure it out later. Yeah. And if you do that all the time, like shit can kind of add up and then it, it can get a bit, a bit out of control. Um, but I would say like in the, in the particular instance that was the worst case scenario, scenario of this, it was just a shit attitude all around. Um, but you know, we've moved on from that. Um, so it's not really like, I think everyone's like super committed now. And like, if we had to, you know, find the money for something, we would just figure it out. But, I'm just trying to get away from that as much as possible. And I want the band to, yeah, basically fund itself for pretty much everything. Um, but, um, yeah, man, we don't really, like, there hasn't really been that much tension in this lineup at all. It's been, it's been pretty crazy, hey? Like, it's a, you know, it's a, it, it can be a bit of a gamble when you uh, bring someone in. Like, Matt is the most recent inclusion, but he's still been in the band for, like, a few years and, like, no one really knew him very well when he, when he came into the group, but and you, you kind of, you know, getting to know each other on the road and stuff like that, which is, a, you know, I guess a bit of a risk. Like you wouldn't just meet someone and go, you want to go on holiday? Like, <laughs> so, you know. So, um, but yeah, man, I think like we're all like super patient with each other's personality traits and um, from, yeah, just from an all-round band perspective, it's a pretty good group and it's not, not to say we haven't had a lot of shit in the past with some um, members that just haven't really gelled but you know that's pretty common like I was listening to a podcast with the guy from Between the Buried and Me today and he was saying that I think they've had the same line off pretty much the whole time mm. I just like that is such a fluke like any band that's managed to pull that off is just like so lucky man because um, yeah you got to go through some shit to, <laughs> to find the right dudes and that, that can be that's always the hardest part yeah it, it's and I think it's tough because Especially, I mean, it's probably like this in, in other parts of the world, no doubt. But um, I think in Australia and, and our local scenes, and they've been very much up and down as far as consistency, stability, having regular venues, regular touring circuits, and having something that's somewhat reliable in place. And so for bands, you know, it is really, it's not even part-time. It's sort of like a casual sort of appointment where you get to play every once in a blue moon, every, you know, maybe once a year you get to do a run of shows and it's never usually that extensive unless you get the chance to go overseas. And yeah. I think it's, it's a case where it's, it's really a working, a working sort of balance where people have got to fund their lives and they can't afford to just go full time and, and hit the road for you know, X amount of weeks in a row or, or months and just tour overseas and all that sort of stuff. And to get to that point is such a massive jump uh, from just the situation where we've all been in, where it's like, you know, 
people have got families, they've got a day job, they might not have any annual leave le- left, they've got no money in the bank, maybe they want to try and buy a house if they're lucky, or maybe they've, they've, they're behind on their rent, or they've got an unexpected bill from their car. You know, there's all these things that just constantly against the, the whole thing of a band existing. And that's why, you know, one of many reasons why bands just don't last the test of time, especially sort of in that sort of local space and in Australia, because it's just, it's just too much of life that gets in the way. And so you really need those people that have, that are, that have got the right sort of mental sort of approach with it, where they can look at the bigger picture and go, I can make this work. And, you know, there will be some sacrifices along the way, but that the sacrifices will be short term, um, you know, because we're, we're aiming for something that's going to be more sort of, you know, further down the track. That's right. I mean, like, yeah, like life is you know, more like just re- regular day to day life is like more than you get more time than you're going to spend on the band unless you're like, like me and you're just a total lifer, you know, like you have to like get to that point where you're just like, all right, this is, I'm just going to do this until I can't, you know, like, if, yeah, like touring here, you, it's just not, it's just not the same dynamic as it is in like the States or Europe. You can't, like, a tour here is like, three maybe three shows in a row if you're lucky like mm. and it's just every weekend and it's all it's like this this one we've got is like so spaced out man yeah and that's just out of necessity but like you know that's pretty common for tours here um it's just like you know oh we're going on tour and then you play like a show it's like when's the next one it's like oh three weeks you know <laughs> it's not really a tour like it's just a run of shows and it's like i, I find that frustrating sometimes because i like the um just getting into the routine of playing every night mm. like just get, you get so tight and it's just like playing like the set it's just it becomes easy after like three shows in a row it's like fucking hell this is like we're, we're a proper band now doing this you know but it, it, it's hard to do that in australia because it's just like yeah one or two here here and there sort of thing yeah and um yeah it's um it, it i mean I've, I've said this a few times in the past but uh yeah you get to that like that third show and things just start to show like amongst the, the guys in the band everything's just starting to gel a bit and you're going oh this feels great and then it's like oh, the, yeah. next, the like, next day you're sort of waking up early in the morning to go to go to your day job and just like oh fucking the slap of reality <laughs> yeah totally man yeah and then it's just like that awkward like you know four or five days in between the next show and then you're kind of like yeah oh, we're still tight but you know like oh i thought we were onto a bit of a you know we're on the good run there but when you like go to Europe and actually do that, it's so fucking good. Like, when you come back and then play a show, everyone's like, "Holy shit, you guys like next level tight." It's like, yeah, because we just played every night for three weeks. You know? Yeah, yeah, like, definitely, definitely unique here. It's 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 very tough, and and that's what sort of makes me think that you know some of this regional stuff, and and hopefully sort of the you know, our country opening back up, that it might open up the sort of the minds of, you know, venues and, you know, places that have, they've lost a lot of money over the years and, you know, or over the past 12 months, I should say in particular, but, you know, places that have been ne- neglected for, for live music will start to be open-minded about getting some of this stuff happening again. And I don't know, I mean, I'm, I think, I think I might be a, a bit sort of stretched on this idea, but, you know, I, I'd love to see bands playing on a Wednesday night and, or worse still, you know, on a Monday or Tuesday night. I mean, you know, you've got Frankie's in the city who just runs a successful club and yeah. obviously very unique in what they do, but there's nothing to, to stop, you know, venues doing versions of this around the country and creating a proper circuit where a band can go on the road and actually make a sustainable sort of uh, tour uh, without having to stop and go home and pay the bills and then go back out and try and kickstart the, the engine again. Yeah, totally, man. I think it can be done. I mean, like, you know, if, if a big international comes here and the show's just on a Tuesday, like, people still go. Yeah. Like, so if people really want to go to something, they'll go to it. It's yeah. just about get, getting them there. That's always the hardest part. I think, um, like, it won't be for everybody, but I think, for, especially from a white-collar worker perspective, um, I'm I'm noticing that 
not everyone's still working at home, but there's more of that flexible sort of arrangement where people can still work from home a few days a week. And I think the more that that becomes the norm, the more that people will start to go out on a sort of air quote school night and not have to worry about the, the grind the next morning of commuting and, and sort of being up at the crack of dawn and all that sort of stuff where they can, you know, roll out of bed, bed and turn their laptop on and, uh, and just get started at home and just sort of, you know, nurse that hangover if they're going to go out drinking on a Tuesday night or something like that. So I think some of those things will also help the the likelihood of, of some of these sort of week shows becoming sort of somewhat of a success. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, I think, um, uh, especially in Sydney, we just need a little bit less uh, small bars and some more venues. But, you know, it's not the easiest place in the world to have to own a venue, Sydney, as we all know. But, um, you know, I don't know. We need some, like, mad mad investors to just throw some cash. But, if, <laughs> like, there's just, like, like, Newtown has just always been, like, I work there and I go out there all the time and I'm always thinking like there's not a cool like decent sized venue to play in there really like there's a lot of cool really small venues there's like Highway and there's like Wayward and stuff like that but since the Sando closed it's kind of like there's not really anything with like a decent stage like and like the hub's just been sitting there yeah just doing nothing for years but um yeah I mean it's a bit cold you know take out the millions and millions of dollars you need to start a venue. Um, and if I had that, I would do it. I'd love to do that one day. But, um, yeah, man, it's a gamble. Yeah, I, and who knows? I mean, you might find that I, I always look, looked at the hub and just looked, just thought, oh, man, like that's what a wasted opportunity, that thing just sitting uh, there just doing nothing, you know. But, uh, yeah. Premium, like. Oh, it, it would just – I mean, that would be a game changer, especially with how central that is in Newtown. It's just like – the ease yeah. is walk across the road from the train station. You're there, you know, um, and I think that's what we missed in in the city as well. For years, we had the Gaelic and we had Bar Broadway, and and even yeah. like for a while there, we had you know the Lair, which was part of the Metro, and and a few other places that were sort of very somewhat central in sight in in the city itself. And so you could just get off the train or, or get the bus to you know Central Station, and just you were pretty much at the venue, and you, you were good to go, and it was easy to get home as well. So, um, yeah, I don't know, but I mean, you know, it might be a case that a lot of commercial spaces are trying to find things to fill it with, and maybe there's some cheaper opportunities to get, to get things, uh, happening. So, but I mean, yes, it will be people with probably bigger, uh, deeper pockets than, than us, but, uh, yeah. hopefully we can inspire someone who's got a bit of cashola to get, get out there and get something started. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like the other thing is I'd like to see a few more venues just be a little bit more, um, open-minded with like genres mm. um, like it's just I, I think that there's, there's something to that in like all um, facets of music like just being open to things like one of the things that we wanted to do this year as well was um, as much as we want to hit all these regional places just like get some different bands on the bill like I'm pretty tired of that formula of just having you know three thrash bands that sound pretty similar to round out a bill like and it, you know it, it, it still is a small scene and chances are you've probably seen those bands before um whereas if you book like a stoner rock band on a death metal show like fucking why not yeah and then that way, like people in the crowd get to see a band they might not have seen before and then the band gets to play to different audience as well i think it works both ways and i think it's something that um more bands and more venues should get on board with like i think that's really productive way to like move the, the same chord and bring it together a bit especially with like a you know if you're a punter you're going out for a show on a friday or saturday night traditionally and you know you, you're going to see three or four bands play i mean you don't want to hear more or less the same style of metal or rock or whatever it might be throughout the entire night because everything just blends into the same you know lump of noise and those bands in their own right are fantastic but once you get to that fourth band and they and they're the headliner you're you're just exhausted and so your attention yeah. span is is really stretched then so yeah variety is like it's just it's key it's absolutely key and so, i mean imagine just being able to play to a crowd that's actually enthusiastic and excited because they're, they're watching a whole range and array of different types of uh, bands getting up on stage and performing and just yeah oh, there's nothing nothing worse than just a, a pure 
a pure anything night, whether, whether it be thrash metal, yeah, death metal, like power that. metal, whatever. Yeah, it, it, you just get burnt out by it. Like, it's just boring after a while, you know? Like, even if all those fans are sick, it's like, yeah, you, you need to, like, lie down after four death metal bands in a row. <laughs> yeah, that's um, right, exhausting. But, yeah, and, like, I think there's been this weird thing that, uh, like, certainly in Australia, like, at, you know, the local scene at least, is, like, I feel like um, a lot of people don't have a lot of faith in metal bands to pull in numbers, so to compensate that, they just book more bands. It's like, we're going to book fucking 12 bands on this gig and then, you know, heaps of people will come and then you're playing and then you're just playing other bands. It's like, there is ways to, you know, properly promote shows with, like, less bands and it can still be... And then people get paid properly when you do that as well. So, I don't know, I've always thought that was a really weird thing. I try We try to avoid those, like, massive, like, 24 bands of, you know, brutal fucking metal all day. It's just like, we've done a few of those where there's like this, just the same front of house guy mixing the whole thing. And after like band five, he's fucked. Like, you know, <laughs> like, there's no chance you, if you're playing after that, you're going to get a good mix. Um, but it's, like everyone, you know, in the crowd is feeling the same way, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, man, just like spice it up a bit. It keeps it exciting. Yeah, we, one thing that we were looking at, and we started to push quite hard, where and we we got a, a fair bit of resistance for it. So, um, was two things. One was that we would never go on stage any later than ten thirty, because yeah. it's just a traditional type of show. Because you know, especially in sort of the larger cities, people trying to get home, people aren't driving themselves, and public transport sucks in a lot of places. And, um, and really, I mean, you know, a lot of these venues are trying to get the headliner to go on, you know, around midnight just to try and keep the bar open. And what we just said in return was we can be the headliner, but it doesn't mean the night ends. Go and put on a DJ that just plays Iron Maiden all night and you'll keep the crowd. The crowd just want to sing and party. So keep the bar open, throw a DJ on or chuck a, chuck a projector screen up and, and just play, you know, videos on off YouTube or something like that, or put a covers band on, like whatever, just something to keep the party going. And um, that was a big thing that we pushed because it was just so many times where we saw our crowd starting to dwindle by the end of the night or be so exhausted because they'd been there for several hours drinking and just watching all these other bands. And it was just the energy was getting sucked out of the room and you could see people having to leave halfway through the set because, you know, they've, they've got their last train home or whatever it is. And the other thing, like what you just said is, yeah, man, there's nothing worse than playing a show where you've got anything more than four bands. Uh, you know, four bands is That's, busy in itself, yeah. but, um, man, I think, I think a three band lineup is, is a sweet spot, um, where you can have enough intermission time between hands so for, for people to sell merch and to do whatever they want to do. And, um, bands can have a half decent set and it still has time at the end of the night for people to, to party and have a, have a good night and, and stick around if they want to. But, um, yeah, anything more than that, it's just, uh, it's, you you're stretching the punter's attention span and they get exhausted and there's nothing worse than playing one of those shows with 20 other bands and you're all trying to fight for merch table space and you get a yeah. punter that walks up to the area and they just look at everything and they don't, they just give up. They walk away because they don't even know where to start. And so you don't sell anything. Yeah. They're just overwhelmed. Yeah. But yeah, like the, the, the best lot on those gigs is at like six o'clock. Cause like Not that's yet. when people are like, you know, the people that have been there for a while are starting to get a bit loose or like people are just rocking up. But yeah, if you like end up on one of those like 11 PM slots, man, oh fuck. <laughs> it's, it's, it's brutal. It's tough. It is tough. I, I, I almost want to start another band just so I can just do like the, the opening spot at like seven thirty, eight o'clock or something like that. Just get in. <laughs> yeah. Where everyone's primed and excited just to be out and seeing live music. You can, and then you can just pack up, hang around the merch table, flog some merch and sink some beers and just enjoy the rest of the show and not having to worry about, uh, whether people are going to stick around. So maybe, maybe that's on my to-do list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, uh, so, um, one thing I was going to ask you, you mentioned right at the start, um, around, um, sort of these shows that you started doing and the the whole arrangement with people seated at the shows as well. Um, yeah. I think you sort of, you sort of alluded to the answer anyway, but I think it's more of a, um, I think you sort of said, look, you know, a show's a show, but did you guys sort of collectively have a discussion around whether you guys wanted to wait a little bit uh, and avoid this format of, of 
uh, people seated because, you know, you're playing metal. It's really, I mean, if you're an acoustic act getting on stage, then having a seated audience is, is fine because everyone can chill out and enjoy, you know, the vibe of it all. But, um, you know, thrashing out to, to metal, um, can be, can be really difficult. Was there, was there hesitation or even just a discussion about whether you guys should do this or not? Um, well, I was just like frothing to play something. Yeah. So I wasn't that worried, but I mean, like we did, we, we did two shows at the end of last year and like, yeah, I mean, I was like, I didn't know how to feel about it at first, I guess. Um, but you kind of like, it's just, it's, it's weird for like one song, I reckon. And then you kind of just like, oh, well, this is just what it is. And we're just going to get around it and just embrace it. Like, it kind of makes you play better in a way because everyone is just like staring directly at you. <laughs> like, there's no like, I mean, at, at a good show, like the first half, like the, the, the stage side of the room is just fucking pierced and carrying on, not really watching what's going on. Yeah. So just to have those like eyes on you, you're like, oh, you better be better be on the ball tonight, sort of thing. Um, but yeah, like we did, we did one in the basement in Canberra, and that was like. Yeah, that was pretty weird, but um, it was still, it was still cool. And then we did one at Frankie's, and like, even though that was seated, the vibe was really cool. Like, I, I, I just forgot, like, after two songs, really. And I was like, this is sick. Like, we're on stage, we're doing what we do. Um, and, and yeah, man, like, just there was so much, um, like, cancelled shows and shit last year that I was just like, if we get offered anything, let's just do it. Um, like, fuck it. If it's a bit weird, it's a bit weird. Um, I've, I've listened to a lot of opinions on this from like other dudes in like bigger bands and stuff. And they're like, there's no way I would ever play a show without a pit and stuff. <laughs> but I don't know, like, like I said, man, you get one song in and you're like, we're playing on a stage through PA. This is fucking awesome. So we just, yeah, we just embraced it. And, um, I mean, I was hoping that by the time we started this tour, that it would be all standing, but, um, wasn't to be for the first two shows, but that's all right. We got plenty more. Um, so yeah, man, that oh, was cool. I mean, like the, the fans were still really awesome. Like I said at the start, like the, the crowbar show was still pretty wild. Like there was, um, some chair moshing going on. Courtesy <laughs> Bangs boys. And yeah, it was, <laughs> it was pretty out of control actually for, for a seated crowd. Um, and yeah, like people like, yeah, like we were saying, like the whole point was, yeah, people are just so like keen to, to come out and like they'll, they'll just make the most of it and the bands make the most of it as well. I think everyone is just like really stoked to be involved. So yeah, man, it didn't really bother us too much. Yeah, I think um, I think if we had a functioning band where we had all of our members, you know, within arm's reach and, and ready and willing, we probably, we probably would have been sort of in a similar mindset about just getting just getting out and fucking playing like i think um yeah. i think the situation although it, you know the last 12 months has felt like a lifetime in some respects it is only a year it's only a 12 a 12 month period and before we yeah. know it we'll we'll be back to standing up in pubs and and drinking beers and and and, and ignoring the bands while they're playing and all that sort of stuff and <laughs> and it'll just feel like nothing like that year that happened was just uh you know a distant memory and we will just sort of forget about it so I think short term, you just, yeah, I mean, just, I guess why not? Hey, I mean, I've, I've been one of those guys who, who said, look, I don't know if I could do it um, because I, just, I was so, I think, very self-conscious about that energy suck from the room where you don't have people sort of standing upright and sort of responding to what you're doing instead of just being seated, uh, seated and sort of almost like a sedated sort of thing. But um but man, I've, I've seen some shows and I've seen, I've also seen footage and, and photos and seeing people, like you said, like chair moshing and just like trying to headbang and hang over the, the chair and stuff like that. And, and I think, as you said, probably after that first song or two, you, you just tend to just not pay attention to that anymore as far as, you know, that unique format and just, it's, it's a crowd, they get into it and, and that's it. Yeah, that's it, man. You just got to embrace it straight off the bat, really. And, um, I mean, I tried to get out to as many shows as I could um, when venues started to open up again. Um, and I think, yeah, like people were very respectful of what they had to do to make the show happen. You know, like, all right, if i got to sit down and you come to me to give me my beer, you know, that's fucking weird. 
but and this is a death metal show, but I'm just going to do it, you know, because it keeps the band on stage and it keeps the venue going for another week. You know, it's like, I feel like it was, a, yeah, this whole thing has been a real short term thought process. It's just like, you know, we've got to just fucking do what we can now to keep this going. Um, and like, yeah, that's been very well respected on both sides of the stage, I think. Um, yeah, it's just been like one thing I found is that has been quite strange was just like booking things in the future knowing that i mean not really knowing 100 percent, but hoping that restrictions won't be there by the time of the show Mm. but at the time of the show you're booking it you have to abide by that which means you know everything's limited and there's different stage setups and stuff like you have to be three meters behind like the state like the, the vocalist has to be three meters away from the front row basically so in a small venue, that can cut into the capacity by a fair bit, mm. you know, if it was a show. Um, so, yeah, man, it's just, I think, like, the booking process has been the most challenging part of it. And I think, like, that, that first show that we got to do back after not playing for ages last year was, like, as soon as we started playing, I was like, oh, man, this is what we're supposed to be doing. We're not supposed to be fucking doing, you know, a million emails and, all that shit, I almost forgot what this felt like, you know, <laughs> like, it's like just, just to have it back was just like the, the best feeling. So, uh, so I guess for anybody that's listening to us, uh, talk where we're actually recording this and having this chat, uh, pretty close to when it's actually going to come out. And you've, you guys have got some shows coming up this weekend, I believe interstate. Yeah, man, we're going to Melbourne and Geelong this weekend. Should be cool. So I mean, I haven't played in Melbourne for ages. Actually, like oh, even yeah. before COVID, we had a, a cancelled show, which was not related. So I think it's been a little while. I think it's been like two years almost. So that'll be cool. So with, um, obviously, you know, being in Sydney, we're not directly impacted at the moment with uh, all the shit that's been happening north of us up in Queensland. But do you, I mean, do you guys sort of have backup plans in, in mind when you know, shit may hit the fan. I don't want to jinx you guys. I'm touching wood here. I'm touching everything for you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think just going back to what you said before, like you, you wanting to plan things in advance, but really there's an element of this unknown instability where shit could just go wrong really quickly. And we've seen it multiple times over the past several months. Have you guys sort of thought about contingency plans in the event that, you know, government turns around and starts being difficult and, and stopping us from, from going into state? Um, not heaps. I mean, like, we just drive everywhere, basically. So we've only got two, uh, like, two or three shows in this tour that we need to fly. So, I mean, if we have to cancel flights and stuff, that would be a massive pain in the ass. Mm. But um, if something gets cancelled on the East Coast, it's just like we just don't go and then that's it, you know. Um, but I don't know. I haven't really thought about it too much. It's just been like, yeah, I mean, every time we think we're out of the woods, something else fucks up, right? <laughs> yeah, um, that's right. Frustrating, man. Well, I, uh, I'm almost regretting I'm, I'm, saying anything now because, uh, you know, I, I feel like I've just jinxed, jinxed the band. If something goes wrong <laughs> tomorrow, mate, I'm, I'm just, I'm hiding. I'm going into hiding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it'll be right. I think, yeah, I mean, I, I reckon I'll be pretty on top of this Brisbane situation, hopefully. Yeah. Because um, th- that show is probably going to be one of the bigger ones for the tour. Um, so, yeah, man, I don't know. There's nothing you can do, really. Like, we'll just see what happens. And if we play, we play. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep rebooking and just keep booking shows until we can do them. Because, uh, yeah, we've we got a tour of this record, so... <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Whether whether it takes you know over a few weeks or over a few months or whatever it is, it's just you know it'll it'll happen one way or another. It's just a case of when. Yeah, right. Sure. And I think you guys, uh, or yourself personally in particular, have have certainly had sort of experience over the years touring you know, around the place and overseas and all that stuff, and having sort of the instability or the unknowns of just shit changing and having to sort of you know, get creative in the moment. So I guess sort of with this, you've at least got an element of the comfort of being at home and when things go wrong, you can, I mean, it's still an absolute pain and a logistical nightmare at times, but at least you're not sort of somewhere else in, in the world where you've got to try and work out, you know, uh, you know, a, a quick sort of 
fix to try and you know keep yourselves safe and and obviously from a financial point of view as well because i know and i'm I'm not prying for your indonesian story because i feel like that's your claim to fame over the past several <laughs> years sorry i still get asked about that all the time i right? bet i <laughs> bet mate fair enough. It's, it's pretty fucking epic <laughs> but i'll um i'm gonna link to uh because i think you guys have got the um house fox studios uh live sessions um, yeah we've, but, we've got stuck into it there yeah yeah so i think i might i might direct people to that and i'll i'll, I'll give them i'll give them the 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 spotlight for that story because it's a fucking cracker cracker of a story and um yeah. and certainly well, ryan really wanted to talk about that i think he you know he caveated that conversation by saying oh yeah just go you know all the time because I love surfing, but you got kicked out of the country, so you know, can you tell us about that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. And at least it's at least it's you know it's documented as well. So you know, whenever someone asks you in the future, you can just flick them the link to the YouTube video and go, "Hey, there you go. It's all there. Yeah. It's all there." But yeah, man, like fuck, like no tour has ever gone to plan, really. Like you know, you, you can't trust it if it does. Like there's always something that fucks up. There's you know, there's so many spinal tap moments. Um, getting kicked out of the country is one of the more extreme ones. You don't obviously want to avoid that, but you know, it's, um, yeah, man, like you, you get a bit of resilience about you when you go through shit like that. And yeah, it, it, it teaches you how to adapt in pressure situations and often touring, that's what touring is. So, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it was fucked, but like, I'm glad it happened in a way. Like, and, you know, <laughs> we're, we're still together after that. So I uh, can get through anything. <laughs> Oh man, for sure. And look, you know, it's it it's the the kind of gift that keeps on giving. As far as it's it's a talking piece, it's something to to lean back in on, and it's something that you know, it's an icebreaker in a conversation with people who are getting to know the band as well. But what I was sort of curious about is, I mean, even sort of going to Europe and and playing a run of shows in Europe, and you sort of mentioned that earlier. Um, you know, I just know from whether it be my own experience or or mates that have played over there that yeah, even even playing in a in a part of the world where, you know, across countries where, you know, there's, there's a consistent and reliable touring circuit, there's still a lot of ups and downs and unknowns and shit that changes at the last minute. And also being in a foreign country adds that extra element of pressure as well. So no doubt you guys would have experienced that over there. Oh yeah. hundred percent, man. And like, you know, just the, like the idea that you can just go to Europe and just immediately have this amazing tour and play to, thousands of people every night is just not true like yeah. it's like it, it's you know it's it's such it's the most competitive metal scene in the world so to go there and carve out a following takes a lot of fucking time like it does anywhere so you have to be willing to go there and play some pretty shit gigs like that's just how it is um you know just starting out in any in any scene um and yeah we learn a lot about each other and like what that was all about on that tour and i think it like it, we learned some really good life lessons man i'm gonna be honest like um the, the main the main takeaway from that was just how to like harness um negative emotions because you know it's like there, there was a lot of frustrating moments on that run like there was some there was a, i don't want to throw anyone under the bus but there was there was some egos flying around um not in our band but um and like it was a very like the budget was fuck all, so we had two bands in one van for the whole time. the The routing of the tour was like really weird. Um, I was like looking at the map constantly, going, "Why the fuck are we going around here when we could have just played two shows on the way?" But um, so you know, there's shit like that all 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 the time, pretty much every day. So you just got to find ways to overcome that. And um, we kind of just, I remember, I think we were in Belgium somewhere. And we played this ridiculous gig in this tiny, tiny venue. And um, that was when, you know, the, the, I guess the touring party sort, sort of started to drift a little bit apart. Um, and we would just always go do our own thing. And we, we kind of just said, look, man, there's no, there's absolutely no point picking fights with anybody. Like, it's just not productive. It's not going to get us anywhere. But if you're pissed off, just get on stage and just play harder. And that was like, this made all the difference. Like, we, we had this vehicle um, every night to channel our shit day into. Not that, that every day was a shit day. We had a really, really fun time overall. But 
you know, if something pissed us off, we could just go up on stage and just fucking rip it. And that felt really good. Um, so we learned that about ourselves. You know, you don't have to get into fights about stuff. It doesn't really solve any problems. But if you have, you know, if you happen to have a band, you just play, play shit on show and you feel pretty good after that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way of looking at it. And I, I, I've, I've always said that I think just being in a band in general, whether you're just playing locally around town or, or you're touring, you know, overseas and, and, and playing regularly, you know, in all sorts of different places. It's just such a weird social situation to be in. I mean, not only yeah. are you spending a lot of time with a bunch of other people that you're consistently around all the time, but you're, you're traveling together, you're, you're performing on stage, but then you you've also got the other 20, 20 plus hours together where you've got to work out how to function around each other. And it's like a marriage. It's like having multiple partners uh without without all the sexual stuff attached to it but all that all the, all the emotional relationship based stuff where you've got to continuously compromise you've got to take the high road you've got to pick your battles you've got to work out when to speak up and when to shut your mouth and and that's that's a really tough thing for most people to be able to handle so and i think you know unless you unless you're in a band or in some kind of sort of touring party doing something uh, most people will never get into that dynamic or that situation where they really have to think like that. So it is it is a really weird thing. And I think if the bands who do succeed, I think it's a test of their character because you really have to dig deep at times to overcome the the most trivial of things to the most dramatic of things um, that are constantly in your face every single day. Yeah, man, that's right. And you're totally right there. Like it is the weirdest dynamic ever. Um, and yeah, like, you know, if you can't get over something in like the space of a day, that lineup is just not going to function because there's always something more important to, to do. Like you're there to do the show. So if you're bitching about something really trivial, that's just going to, you know, fuck everything else up. It's just, it's just not going to work. So yeah, it is a test of character hundred percent, but, um, yeah, man. I think it like it, it teaches us some really, really important life lessons. I reckon if you can get through something like that, because it's just like, just, and like especially like a tour like the one we did, it was like the absolute furthest thing you could imagine from a holiday, really. And like even the places we went, we didn't even go to any major spots. Like we we do like two or three shows in like Italy and they're all places I'd never heard of that were like not near anything. <laughs> but everyone's like, "What'd you do there?" I was like. Nothing. We played so a show. That's it. <laughs> the gig was like, you know, we we drove down a dirt road for three hours in the dark and realised we were going the wrong way, and then there was twelve people there. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's, you know, it's, it's not yet. It's like I don't know. It's worth it for the stories. I like, I love looking back on that shit and just you know just going, how fucking ridiculous was that? And you know, at the time it can be super frustrating and annoying, but yeah, like it is a, a, a test of character to get through that. And if you can do it with. Yeah, mate. So it just brings you closer together. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's good, man. I think um, one one of the things I just I always told myself, especially when 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 you're really getting stretched and, and tested, was about how good this will be as a story later on down the track. And it's like right now, this is not great, but later on, I'm going to be able to reflect back and have a laugh and 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 sort of tell yeah. tell a great story out of it. But um, you, you certainly have to even keep those comments to yourself because if you say it to you know, to your, your bandmates and say, hey, we'll laugh about this one day. They, they're probably going to clock you one. But, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it is definitely tough. Yeah, man, 100%. We've had, we've had many, <laughs> many times like that. So um, Cathedral Bones out now. It's been out for, for a bit. Um, I guess comparing... This is my... These are my stock standard uh, interview questions for, for Musos. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, obviously... It looks like, I mean, this is the first time I've really, I've, I've known of you guys for years. I mean, obviously being being in Sydney um, and have seen you around the traps, but I think this is the first time where I've actually seen the band show up in my line of vision so much, so often, that yeah. it must be a completely different situation for you guys now as far as what you're experiencing versus the previous releases that you put out, um, you know, over the past 10 odd years. Yeah, man. We like... With this one, we just went, fuck it, we're going to go all in on this. Um, like, we had a pretty good team with PR, and um, but also just, like, the, the preparation was the, the main factor, I think. Um, like, we did a really solid amount of pre-pro. Um, so from a writing perspective, that really helps, like, 
get the songs to where we wanted them and we were super prepared when we went to the studio. Um, but just try, like last year as well, one good thing that came of that um, was that we were able to just take a bit more time to think about the release and really lock that in and make sure that it was going to be smooth and, and, and like run solidly. Um, like we did a couple of video clips um, that took a, a fair bit of planning as well. And like looking back on it now, I'm not sure that it wouldn't have been, it would have been, they were already really hard to film both of them, to be honest. Um, but without all that time that we had, like the, the concepts and the, and the filming process would have been even more challenging. So mm. it's kind of good in a way that we had a little bit of extra time when we weren't like, you know, flat out riding or touring to just like take a step back and think about how we were going to actually do this thing that we've been working on for the best part of three years. Um, and that was like a huge factor. Like, you know, we, we did spend so much time on this record, so we weren't just going to throw it out there. I mean, we could have released it last year probably, but like without anything like without any shows to support it properly and without that like proper network of people to help us get it out to as many people as possible. I just think it would have been a waste of, of good shit. So I'm glad that we did that. Um, and yeah, like it's just the difference in response between this and the last record has been massive. Um, yeah, like I, I guess we were still kind of finding our feet a little bit with like, um, just like in, interaction with our audience a little bit on the last one. So that's been something that I've really tried to work on. Um, just, you know, creating that like virtual merch desk, I guess, <laughs> you know, just having contact with people all the time and stuff. Um, and yeah, like you know, a bunch of other, uh, other stuff that's m- made this release run really smoothly. So yeah, man, I think it's just come down to that a little bit of extra time, which ended up being a really good thing for us. Yeah. I've, uh, one of the, one of the common th- themes that keep popping up for me and I keep highlighting it is just this whole patience piece. I think, I think one thing that has sort of been reinforced over the past year is that, uh, I think for any band, uh, time is on your side. I think it's always on your side and I think you can, you can afford to, you know, record an album and sit on it for a number of months or, or a year, depending on, you know, the reasons for doing it. And, and I think the thing that sort of makes it really tough for a lot of bands is that you're, you're on social media, you're seeing your mates and your peers out there touring and getting these great opportunities or putting this like, you know, flashy album out and getting all these great, great reviews and feedback and hype from, from, you know, the metal community in, in particular. Um, and so you sort of look back in your own sort of backyard and go, Oh, what the fuck are we doing? You know, we've got to, we've got to do something. <laughs> and, and I just, I've realized, you know, just looking at, a lot of bands that, you know, I've idolized and, and really respect, um, over the years, you know, they've, they've had breaks between albums and maybe they did tour, maybe they didn't. And in the long term, when you look back over a career, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter as much. It's just in the moment you feel the panic and the rush that you want to try and churn something out ASAP because you, you feel like you're going to get forgotten, but you won't. hundred percent, man. And like that whole thing really plays into my, uh, lack of patience so i'm glad that i you know took a step back and really looked at it um in the right way like yeah just it would have been a silly mistake i think to throw it throw it out there um and like it's unfortunate because a lot of other bands like great friends of mine released like dark i've been talking about this a lot because like such a good record but like that latest darker half album Mm. um and like dom did pre-pro for on this album actually yeah he helped with a lot of that um but like that album was amazing and like it just came out in March in 2020 and you know <laughs> Dom was like oh we, we, are we going to go through with it like I don't know how to feel like the label's pushing this thing it's like you know that was at a time where shit was changing every two hours yeah. so you just didn't know but like it's just it just sucks that something so good doesn't get the, the attention that it deserves um, and we were just fortunate that we had extra time to, to to look at it and go, no, this is not the right call to make. So, yeah, man, it's just uh, in, in a way it was very lucky, I think. Yeah, it certainly, I mean, it certainly plants seeds for the future as well, you know, with regards to sort of thinking about, okay, well, what are the next things we want to do, you know, whether it be touring, yeah. whether it be, you know, doing more videos or, or you know, release recording and and putting out new music and sort of thinking you know like i think you used the word before like referring to yourself as a lifer 
you know, and yeah. I think, I think like a lot of us probably feel that way, but we're probably not always conscious of it. And we, or we don't act, act in accordance to being a lifer. Like we, we, we're, we're trying to panic and trying to get everything done ASAP, but in the end it's, it's meant to be a part of our life forever. So take yeah, your time it. and make it count. Yeah. And that's like, I think another huge difference on this record was just, um, the approach was like very calculated as well. Like we had a very detailed release schedule and we made sure that it was like pretty watertight. Um, yeah, that like that, that made a massive difference. It was like, it, it was a couple of months before that, that were the stressful ones, like mm. getting all that together. But when the album was like coming out, I'm like, all I had to do was just like post the shit on social media, really like everything else was done. It was ready to go. Like that was the easy part. It was like getting all getting everything ready to that point. It was a lot of work, um, and it is a lot of work, man. And it should be because it's you know something that you've put you know thousands of hours into. Like when we were started writing this album, like me, I would go around Dom's place pretty much. I was like two or three nights a week uh, for fuck ages, and um, he did such a good job because he was like he filled in for us for a little while, which like that was really cool because he knows like what we're about you know the kind of sound we're trying to we're trying to get and he can objectively look at our music and have constructive feedback and no one will get offended you know mm. he's like he was kind of almost in the band at one point but now that he isn't like if he said something was shit i wouldn't you know get offended at all it's just like i know i know he knows what he's talking about so and that was another thing man like this the the recording team was so solid like tom did all that and then we had Krista Melko do the um, the actual record, and um, but but by the time we got to that point, it was just so we were so prepared. So makes yeah, a lot of difference, it, doesn't it? Oh man, totally. Like just yeah, like I said, just thousands of hours, and that and when you do that, it deserves a proper release. So yeah, when it, it all just came together, man. It feels good. Love it, mate. Um, as I said before, like I this is this is the first time that I've seen the band just in my line of vision as much as it like never before have I seen like flaming wreckage, like just in my face all the time. And, uh, and that's, that's an amazing thing to, to see, especially when you look at the amount of fucking noise and traffic that you're dealing with every day on social media or just out and about where everyone's competing for attention. Um, it's, it's a great sign and hopefully it's just that next, uh, accelerant to, to the next things that you guys are going to do. And, and uh yeah on on to bigger and better things but uh mate congrats on congrats on the album and i've and i've been saying this as well fuck i'm just keep repeating myself on this podcast people are sick of me saying the same things over and over again but <laughs> i'm i'm so fucking pumped to see sydney bands putting music out again i uh, i think you know you man, get, the sydney scene is really fucking good at the moment it's getting there's a lot it's of getting there man it's so good and just to see Bands putting the effort into to putting releases out, and yeah, we can't we can't tour, we can't play shows, can't do the circuits like we used to um, at the moment. But man, just to see bands taking it seriously and getting out there, because there was a stretch of time, and I think you know, no doubt, you know, you would have seen it as well. Where you know, if you if you want to put on a show and, and looking for Sydney bands, um, or you got you know your, your interstate mates coming through and they're asking for suggestions of bands to play with, I mean, really, you're at slim pickings because yeah, most man, of the bands I were inactive um or just not active at all and just just yeah it was just shit and so now it's just fucking it's it's great yeah i definitely agree with that like there was a little weird period there where i, I just didn't know who to ask to play with us um but now it's good and there's a lot of bands across different genres as well which is really exciting so yeah hopefully i'll get my wish with a few cool little mixed builds on the horizon Hey, go and check out the latest album, Cathedral of Bones, which is out right now over at flamingwreckage.com. I'll have links to Dave and the band uh, in the show notes over at andysocial.net and andydowling.net, all the social media pages. I'll have links to Apple Apple Music and Spotify and everything else. I'll have the video clips for Running Blind and The Voiceless in the show notes. I'll have the video clips for House Fox Studio Sessions in particular, and I do recommend this, uh, the interview that the guys did where they talk about the the fucking crazy story that they had from Indonesia about four years ago, just absolutely insane. And they've told it a few times over the years, but this is a really great interview. And so I 
Um, my call to action, in a, in addition to just checking out the video and giving Dave and the band a bit of love, a bit of anti-social love, is to watch this uh, interview. It is just a, it's a cracker of a story. It is just so good. So everything will be in the show notes over at antisocial.net and andydowling.net. Before we wrap it up, of course, Patreon, patreon.com slash andydowling. The number one way, the best way by far to support this podcast. And my goal for this year is to get as many $1 supporters as possible. Go over to Patreon, click on the $1 tier, and all you need to do is set and forget. $1 a month. You won't even notice it, or more than likely you won't. And if you do notice it, hopefully it doesn't hurt too much. Uh, but it's a great way to support this podcast. It's a great motivator for me. And when I get a lot of you guys jumping on board, it's absolutely huge. It's just a massive assistance for for the podcast, the running costs, and just keeping this whole thing chugging away. Uh, it's the reason why the podcast exists in 2021. It's the reason why we've got two episodes a week. It's because of the Patreon community, these legends who have already jumped on. So in particular, I have to thank my top tier supporters. In my top two tiers, these legends are the guys, the heavy hitters, the heavy lifters that have been supporting me on my Patreon journey uh, in, in turn, the uh, Andy Social Podcast. So <clears throat> a massive thank you to Andrew from Perth, Mick G from Sydney, Ash from Daniloquin, Dan from Dapto, Rod from Rayleigh in North Carolina, Patrick from Canberra, Liam from Brisbane, Chris from Sydney, Brendo from Leeton, Tim from Canberra, James from Brisbane, Christian from Canberra, Steve from the Gold Coast, and Andrew from Sydney. Thank you very much, guys. You, you're all absolute legends, and you're part of the wider community of just fucking great people, legends over at Patreon. Um, everyone that's supporting from a $1 tier right up to the bloody crazy $20 tier, just, oh my God, like, talk about guilt money. I've, I've really got to be accountable for my actions now. Um, just it doesn't matter what you guys are pledging. Everyone's just an, an amazing supporter of, of what I do. And uh, as I said before, it's the reason why the podcast exists is because of Patreon now. It, it just makes sense. It's the ultimate motivator. It holds me accountable and takes a lot of the financial pressure off the podcast. It t takes all, all the, the weight off my shoulders where I don't have to worry too much about scraping the dollary dues together to, to cover the costs of hosting and production and all that sort of stuff, um, gear, getting around town and all that sort of, all that sort of those things that you got to deal with when running a podcast. And instead I can focus on having great conversations like the one I did with Dave on this episode. So go and check it all out over at patreon.com slash Andy Dowling. Um, one final little call to action is our new, uh, album is out right now. Our covers album called undercovers volume one is out right now. It's, uh, over on Bandcamp, lordofficial.bandcamp.com. You can go to lord.net.au. It's on Spotify, actually, to be honest. And I think I might have mucked this up on a previous episode. There's, It's a 23-track release, 23 freaking covers, covering everything from John Farnham to Ice House to Kylie Minogue to Savage Garden to Judas Priest to Iron Maiden to Dio to bloody... I can't remember. Wasp. Um, Queensryche. Just heaps of bands. I'm just losing track already. But... Uh, 23 cover songs, but on, on the streaming services, on Apple Music and Spotify and the likes, you'll only get access to 11 of them. So if you want the lot, go to Bandcamp, but of course the album is available on the streaming services as well. So get your ears around it, go and uh, grab a copy of the, of the release and I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. And I think that's about it. Uh, that's all the housekeeping done. Next episode, no idea. We're just going to pull a name out of the hat and we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, I've got a long list of legends to get through and... Uh, the way I'm going, this podcast is going to be around for a few years yet, so I've, I've got a lot of people to tick off the list. So until next episode, folks, take care and ta-ta. Ta-ta.